Okay. Some of my favorite passages are here. In this passage, uh, you know which one it is? Oh, come on. My favorite passage. Okay, 24-7, Exodus 24-7. Uh, he took the book of the covenant, read it in the hearing of the people, and they all said, all that Adonai has spoken, we will do and be obedient. Yes, that was added. <laughs> That's, uh, that is mentioned four times. Um, I believe it's three times in this generation and one time in the younger generation. They say it in Deuteronomy because every generation has to renew the covenant. Yes, Lord, everything you say, we will do. And that's so, so very important. Oh, yes, my favorite verse, Exodus 24, 11. He didn't lay his hand on the nobles of, of the children of Israel. God didn't, lay, God didn't lay his hand on the children of Israel for coming up on the mountain and it says, <clears throat> they saw God and ate and drank. Isn't that beautiful? They saw God and they had an own egg together <laughs> in the presence of God. And uh, I just enjoy that so much. And I am so glad. I'm very thankful for all of you who brought some food today because it's going to be waiting on us. And I'm always glad to eat and fellowship in the presence of the Lord. Okay. Well, this is the 18th partial reading, and it comes from Exodus chapters 21 through 20, what? Four. Uh, this portion is called Mishpatim, uh, which is a word for judgments. Uh, here we have a large number of Mishpatim. Uh, we have 53 judgments. That's a bunch. These 53 judgments are part of the traditional 613 commandments. So each judgment is a commandment. There are different kinds of laws. There are misvot, commandments, mishpatim, judgments, chuchim, statutes, and torot, the, uh, the laws and the, or instructions. Each one of these judgments is just as valid and eternal as the Ten Commandments. In Exodus 18, we have the structure of the judicial system of ancient Israel. These laws and commandments and judgments and statutes are defining the holiness of God. They're defining who God is. As it says, be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And so as we study, as we apply <clears throat> the commandments and judgments and so forth, to our lives, um, Yeshua said it this way, walk in the straight and narrow, walk in the straight and narrow, and, and, and so these commandments are God-breathed, they're holy, they're eternal, and now you have a lot of questions. Sorry, I can't answer all of your questions today. 
However, I can begin to give us maybe uh, a broad understanding, perhaps how to apply them to our day and time. The Ten Commandments, which were given in Exodus chapter 20, that was last week, lay the foundation upon which the laws and the commandments and the judgments and the statutes are built. Yes, you were summarized the Torah in two of its own commandments. Love God. I believe that's commandment number five. And love your neighbor. Don't remember what commandment that is. But it's taken from the Torah to summarize the Torah. And so Yeshua is summarizing, not replacing. The ancient altar was the place. Last week's uh, reading closed uh, with the two laws of the altar. The ancient altar uh, was a place that you would connect to heaven. This is a place of sacrifice and, and worship. The altar that Israel would build must be made from natural stones. They have not come in contact with metal and would not have steps to walk up. Uh, the stones from the earth would be like living stones uh, that are built up to be an altar. Peter, of course, makes uh, mention of living stones in 1 Peter 2, 4, and 5. And so these laws forbade steps and ladders for modesty reasons. When you are involved in worship, you must be dressed modestly. You can't reveal too much. Uh, this commandment is applicable for today because we can draw the principle of modesty in worship from it. Actually spoken of in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 9 and 10, in the same way I desire that women adorn themselves in decent clothing with mod modesty and sensibleness, not adorned with braiding or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but with good works which become women professing godliness. And so I really don't care how old you are, you must be modestly dressed. You can't reveal too much. This also has application in how tight your clothing is because tightness can also reveal too much and feed the imagination. Doesn't require too much imagination, does it? We all come together to worship. Boy, I got a response from that one, didn't I? <laughs> we all come together to worship, so it doesn't matter whether you are actively involved in worship team or the dance team. In fact, modesty needs to characterize our lives. Wherever we are outside of our home, the rules of modesty also apply to men for different reasons. <laughs> In addition to the laws of modesty, we have the guidelines for participating in worship. Did you know we had something like that? Oh, yes. <laughs> Dressed uh, for worship. Uh, there's some out on the table, and uh, you can pick them up. And uh, Because we have what we call halakha. We have rules of the house. You know, It's like rules in the family. We're a family of God, and we build community, so we have to... Uh, have some additional rules. 
So those are them. For men and for women, so uh, do pick one up. Along with the children's uh, boys and girls <laughs> notice. Okay. Well, here we find the first group of laws in the Torah. Begins with the laws concerning slavery. Doesn't mean that the Bible condones slavery, but it does lay down protective laws for slavery. Even the apostolic scriptures mention servitude, but it raises the standard of protection even higher, giving special instructions to the master of the house. Uh, <clears throat> slavery is wrong. Uh, slavery is wrong for this reason. Only God can own what belongs to God. That is his creation. So our text establishes a kind of indentured uh, servitude for a fellow Hebrew who must go free after six years of service, sometime in the seventh year. Uh, the text uses a different word for female slaves and establishes even more protections for her. If a servant wanted to stay with the master, uh, he would have his ear pierced and he would remain in the house for the rest of his life. Uh, you see, the economy was uh, a land-based uh, economy. If you did not own land, then it was a viable option for you to have a permanent job. And, and, and so the, the scriptures help us to deal and to work with principles that are very valid today. Then there is a section on criminal legislation with the death penalty for those found guilty of murder, physically injuring, injuring your parents, and of all things, kidnapping. It goes along with who owns who. The penalty for injuring someone was an eye for an eye. In other words, if you caused the loss of an eye, then you would compensate the person who lost the eyesight. It would be a financial reimbursement for his eye. Uh, in Yeshua's teaching, he said, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you, do not resist evil. Whoever strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him also the other, and to him desiring to sue you and to take your tunic, allow him also to have your coat. You see, Yeshua is giving us his halakha concerning this legal precedent. For example, if you cause the loss of someone's eye in the court, says you must pay $5,000, then compensate the man for his eye. The principle, um, I, actually our Lord expands the principle to include other situations. If, uh, if you're compelled to carry a soldier's pack for one mile, go two miles. If you're sued in court, pay more than what is required. It doesn't seem fair. Uh, but God may use it to break down anger or resentment on either side. It brings in times to, to witness of the mercy of God in your own life. I, I think it reflects on the nature of God who goes far beyond our own request to him, 
reminds me of the principle of turn for a turn. In being generous to others, God is generous to us. Forgive others so that you may be forgiven. As he taught us to pray. And 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 so we're we're giving principles and 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 then we're seeing what Yeshua says and how Yeshua applies them in his day, and then we can apply them in our day. Then there are laws concerning personal liability, like if the animal kills or hurts someone, a thief that is called responsibility for borrowed items. What happens if you borrow something and you lose it or break it? Likewise, oh, you replace it, right? Mm -hmm. Likewise, if someone seduces a woman, a price is required and you have to marry her. <laughs> and you can't get a divorce. <clears throat> you have to take care of her. And then there are what uh, we call apodictic laws or laws that are clearly proven or perhaps very important. Prohibition against sorcery, against idolatry, justice for foreigners, widows, and orphans, lending to the poor, respecting God, honesty in courts, relationships with your enemy, and a number of agricultural laws. And, and finally, this Parsha sets the calendar around the Sabbath and the three pilgrim festivals. In our day, most Christians have been influenced uh, by this whole debate over law and grace. Right. I really don't know why we debate law versus grace. It sounds like you either have one or you have the other. Uh, the argument goes briefly this way. Because of Yeshua, we are no longer, now, no longer under the law, but we are under grace. Um, I don't know if this is... Uh, too much or not. Maybe I'll just skip that. <laughs> I knew, I knew I would regain. <laughs> I, uh, uh, Y'all are really pushing me on this one. <laughs> I've come to the point of seeing that as um uh, would you forgive me before I say it? False doctrine for a number of reasons. Uh, the first reason is this. The law is part of God's grace. It is part of God's grace. We learn from Galatians that the law does not save us. It wasn't designed to save us. The law does not bring a per personal a person righteousness that is imputed to their account in heaven, nor does it bring eternal life. It doesn't do that. God never intended it to do that. It's not the purpose of the law. You see, Abraham believed God and was imputed unto him for righteousness. That was a long time before the law came about. And it began in, in Galatians, it's, it's Paul's first biblical argument that we're not saved through anything good stuff. But we're saved by grace through faith and believing. 
So this is not the, the, the issue. We believe unto salvation through faith in Yeshua alone and nothing else. Now, why the law? For the law points out where we have fallen short of the glory of God. It condemns us so that we will be driven to Yeshua for right standing with God. The grace of God driving me to Yeshua. Uh, That's God's free gift to me. Then once I am declared righteous and eternal life has flooded my soul and the Spirit begins to empower me, the law points me in the right direction. It provides detailed instruction on how to build a loving relationship with God and how to build a loving relationship with God my neighbor, even with my enemies, with one another. That is God's free gift. Grace versus law is a false contrast. God's free gift of salvation to all who believe in Yeshua unto eternal life. The law is God's loving teaching to show God's people how to live out their lives. It, it, it's important for us to, to understand that uh, the law is God's loving teaching to show God's people how to live out their lives. It's all of grace. It is like what Paul says in Galatians 4, 9, but now knowing God, but rather being known by God. How do you turn again to the weak and poor elements to which you desire again to slave anew? But now, knowing God, or rather being known by God, Isn't that interesting? It shows us that any relationship with God begins with God, and that's grace. Uh, It's not that you love God first. God loved you first. And he starts to impact your heart. And he starts to pull you back to him. You see, that's grace. Grace. And each time he pulls us in the straight and narrow, that's grace. You have the Spirit of God, and you are enabled to be holy even as you walk in the holiness that the law spells out very clearly. So what does Paul mean when he says... I wish I was a little further along, but I'm not. Oh, up there. Okay, Galatians 5.18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. But what does he mean? Or when he says in Romans 6.14, for for your sin shall not lord it over you, for you're not under law, but under grace. Well, if we look at uh, Romans 8, uh, verses 1 and 2, we find out that these verses are speaking about the law of sin and death or the law of condemnation. You see, Paul uses the law in different ways. And we have to understand this. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Messiah Yeshua who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. But the law of the spirit of life in Messiah Yeshua has made me free from the law of what? The law of sin and death. That's different from the law. It's the law of sin and death. 
It's the law that is within you. We call it a propensity to do evil. It's just what you're born with. <laughs> you're born with this dynamic. And, and Paul talks about it. He says, what I really want to do, I can. What I really don't want to do, that's what I do. And there's this conflict within me. And it's going on. How can I be delivered from this? And he tells you. <laughs> it, it, it's wonderful. And, and so you're not under the law of condemnation. And you're not under the law of sin and death. Uh, suffice it to say, we need to continue to read in Romans 6, 15, where it says, What then shall we sin because we're not under the law of sin and death, but under grace? Let it not be. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves as slaves for obedience, you are slaves to whom you obey, whether of sin and death, the law of sin and death, or obedience to righteousness. Obedience leads to righteousness. And where do we look for that righteousness? We look to the law. What Paul says is spiritual, and that he longs after it in the inner man. Messiah Yeshua is the living standard, modeling the written standard of Torah, the law. And so in the final word on the subject, follow Yeshua. In the final word on this subject, follow Yeshua. It's so easy to follow everybody else on the web, isn't it? Yes, it is. I've got an assignment for everybody, and that assignment is to read your red letter edition, <laughs> probably the King James Version. You don't have to read the King James Version, but follow the teachings of Jesus. Follow the teachings of Yeshua, and study those. <laughs> study those. They will intrigue you. They will floor you. Uh, they will, oh, what does he mean? And that's good. Be Berean. Always ask questions. Challenge everything. But Yeshua. <laughs> you follow Yeshua. Okay, we try to follow Yeshua as much as possible, and when we don't, you tell us where. Okay? Okay, there is a section in Exodus 23, 4, and 5 that speaks to loving your enemy. <laughs> and what it is to love your enemy. In Matthew 5, 43, uh, to 45, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless those cursing you, do well to those hating you, and pray for those abusing and persecuting you, so that you may become sons of your Father in heaven, because he causes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. Sins rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those loving you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do that. And if you only greet your brothers, what exceptional thing do you do? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, application. Therefore, you be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And so when Yeshua said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, this was, uh, saying was 
either coming from a misunderstanding or misinterpretation of those who were teaching man-made laws as if they were doctrines of God, or the common feeling of Yeshua's day for the oppression and hatred of the Roman occupation, because nowhere in the Tanakh, nowhere in Torah does it teach this. And yet Yeshua is addressing this common feeling of his day. He says, love your enemies. Even bless them. Go out of the way to do good to them. Why? Because God does. And we're to imitate God. And so Yeshua sets the standard much higher as he applies Torah to his day. Even Paul teaches uh, a variation of this commandment to love your enemy in Romans chapter 12. He says, repay no one evil for evil. And that's even... That's part of um, a turn for a turn. Don't return evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it's possible, as far as in you, be at peace with all men. Do not avenge yourselves, beloved, but giving place to wrath, for it says, vengeance is mine. I'll repay, says the Lord. Therefore, application. If your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, you shall woe. You see, Yeshua's teachings, he'll throw you a curve. He's talking about all this love, and then he says, for in so doing, you shall heap coals of fire on his head. Whew. <laughs> Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It's a dynamic principle, I would say, law of Yeshua. Overcome evil with good. Again, how we feel about an enemy cannot dictate how we treat an enemy. Our actions has to be different. Our actions must be motivated by love, which overcomes our feelings. And God, the eternal one, is free to do as he chooses. <laughs> Sometimes we let God loose to work things out, even in the life of our enemy. Let's bow our heads and pray. Gracious heaven.